I want to meet her. <laughs> That's a very hard act to follow, <laughs> it's your, your CV. <laughs> and then not to mention the CEO, Lucy, and Tori James, who spoke before me. I'm under no pressure whatsoever <laughs> at this point. And then, of course, I have to let you all get past your sixes and your fours. I don't know who put those. <laughs> like who really put that on a morning like this? Because I'm here to teach you that you can get fire in your belly again. Yes? We can reinvent because there's resilience. And reinvention is something that comes. Sometimes we choose it. Sometimes it chooses us. But how do we deal with enforced reinvention. That's what Crytek is facing so very well. And they have led by the example of recruiting very well with the, the new CEO. And they also were you know, a bit proactive five years ago in launching uh, the uh, Fair Play Employer Limited because they kind of figured out, well, listen, change is coming. We got to get ready for this change. Yes? So this morning, I don't want to hear about any fives and sixes and fours in terms of your, you need to get fired up. Yes? Because change has come and change, whatever it might look like, believe me, we can decide that the change is good. Now, who am I to tell you all about that? We're like, seriously, what's, what, what, what's, my, what's my credibility? Why can I tell you that? This young lady has seen a lot of change. The first one was imposed on me because I wasn't ready for that change. And that was going back to when I was a little girl in Jamaica. And I know a lot of people, even today I met people who said to me, oh, Bernie, you know, I hear about you. And people say, you're so lovely, you're so lovely. You're so <laughs> I wasn't so lovely, so lovely <laughs> when I was a little girl. Seriously, because <laughs> I was a fourth of five children. And I grew up in a very it's a powerful, eye powered kind of um, household. And even now, I still have to grapple to find my way. But you know, I've come a long way, we've come a long way, but I've come into myself. But you can imagine being fourth of five, and you have my siblings who are like so powerful, so, so strong, and, and my parents so powerful and so strong. And you know, you're born, anybody from African descent or Caribbean descent, or you know, people that you know that you're born, you have a pulse, you do well. <laughs> there's, no, there's no argument. You do well, right? So I, I realized, though, when I was about four years old, when we had the weekly quizzes, we had them, can you imagine? In your house, weekly, spelling, multiplication, and all of that. But I realized when I won the coveted tin of peanuts, I not only won the coveted tin of peanuts, I want something else. Who can tell me what that was? Listen, don't all shout at once. <laughs> Respect. Center stage. Adulation. No longer the little runt. <laughs> so what did I do? I erroneously built this idea around myself that who I was, was what I did. So I developed this very competitive nature that took me all the way up to high school. And, and then of course, to, to top it off, number one, we grew up sheltered. So I couldn't roll with the cool kids. I was dropped off and picked up from school. So, <laughs> so no reputation there. <laughs> I, I was really skinny. I had knobbly knees, bony knees, and, um, and my eyes, I didn't grow into my eyes, and the bulbous eyes. Uh, <laughs> I'm not kidding you, right? And my hair had, you know, now we're streaking. I had natural highlights, but they called that fox hair. So I was called fox hair. I was called frog eyes. I was called horse knees, right? So, yeah, I know. Well, yeah. Oh. <laughs> so, 
but of course I could get them because I was teacher's pet, top of the class. Yeah, so I don't care, I'm rolling them and I'm, and I was obnoxious. I'd get where I wanted, I'd be on your shoulders, yes, leaving in my dust. Come on, that was me. But then, my forest reinvention, which actually really was an enforced retrospection that caused me to find who I was. Because all during the time when people were saying they didn't like me, and I'd go home to my mother and I'd complain about it, she'd say to me, you need to know yourself. You need to know yourself. Temet nosse. She was our university professor, so for my sins, I got it in Latin as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I was like, okay, we're like, seriously, no, mommy. Are you like, are you really serious? I, you know, did you miss Mother in 101, and in particular the module about the troubled teen phase, because this is not helping me. But all my mother had for me was teme no se, know yourself. But because I didn't know myself, I continued in that vein. I got to university, and the best thing that could possibly happen to me in my entire life happened. I fell pregnant. I dropped out of first year university. You know, let that sink in. One, the family I'm from. <laughs> Two, the fact that this little girl based everything about what she thought about herself on what she did. Yes? So that was my moment of looking inside of myself and realizing, because I knew who I was, and I knew the optics did not reflect who I was, because I was not sleeping with the football team, okay? But it looked that way, yes? So I learned, don't judge people. Stop, don't be judgmental, number one. That's the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned is that you need people. Because man, did the people who came around me at that time save my life. Yes? And then it also taught me that what I did is not necessarily who I am. So I started on a journey of finding and knowing myself. Yes, I got back up on my feet. I got back, I, I went back and I studied law and I became a prominent lawyer. But I, am, I was the lawyer I would not have been had I not gone through the route that I'd gone. And so, as I talked to you about reinvention, I sincerely ask you, to know yourself because you cannot reinvent from a place that is disingenuous. You have to reinvent from a place of authenticity. You have to find it within you because every reinvention must find its root in who you really are, what you value, what you're all about, and what you want to do. What do you want to do to serve other people? And that is why the reinvention of Quartag is going to be absolutely awesome because they know who they are. They know what they want to achieve and that is gender equality. That is fair play. That is women's voices being heard in the Senate and other places. That is lifting mothers up to be entrepreneurs. They know who they are and what they want to do. So reinvention <coughs> is just going to be a very simple process. Yes, it will. <laughs> yes. And all of you who have been served by Crytek should follow their example. Right? So, now, so I, you'd think, oh, well, she's reinvented. Yeah, she's had that hard time. Well, oh, it's been hunky dory. She became a prominent lawyer. Yeah, she is standing with all these things. No, it didn't just happen like that. Right? <laughs> so, 
I got to a stage you now where I'm at the top of my field in law and I'm you know, coming to the UK and you know, speaking in London all over the place and you know, all of that. And I got it in my head that it was a good idea when I was approached by some other solicitors in London to come over and get involved with some big project. Hmm. So I moved my family over here in the year 2000. You know the best laid plans of mice and men? <laughs> it didn't work out. But I had moved my family to the United Kingdom. And if you know anything about you know, Jamaicans, we don't go back home <laughs> with our tail between our legs. Yes, as some of the Windrush people that I've dealt with have said, <laughs> uh, they've talked about, and there's this poem I saw, but I remember the line, you know, when they came over to the U UK in the 60s and, you know, they realized that the, this, the, the gold on the, 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 the ground was not gold, it was actually poo. <laughs> <laughs> But they didn't tell anybody, did they? <laughs> More came. <laughs> so, so we don't go back home, okay? So I'm here. I, I, zilch nada. Facing homelessness, joblessness, because I'm told I'm overqualified. But you know, when challenges face you, it's how you respond that makes a difference. Believe me. I didn't even think, I mean, okay, yes, it does exist, unconscious bias. Racism does exist. But at the time, I was not aware of it because I grew up in Jamaica, which was very multicultural. My teachers would come in in their sari, African dress, everything. I had white um, friends. Proper white Jamaican speaking like me. <laughs> yes, Chinese, Indian, everybody. So we were very multicultural. I didn't think. So when they said I was overqualified, 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 I did not think it's because I'm black. Yes? And so I thought, okay, what do I do with this overqualified thing? Mm. I think I probably need to do some reinvention. I didn't think that, say that then. I'm looking back and that's what I did. I now realize. And one of the things that helped me with my reinvention process was humility. You'd have thought, well, that thing that happened in the first year should have made you humble enough. But <laughs> it's a constant journey, keeping you know, your feet on the ground. We are so, it's so easy for us to get, forget ourselves. And one of the things that I did, because I wasn't about to go on the dole, is I, Bernadette Davis, took a job in the basement of Yorkshire Building Society stuffing envelopes. I did that. Because I was not gonna go back home, I was not gonna go on the dole, and I was not going to do anything dishonest. And I remember walking into that place, bouncing in the, just in the joy of doing something. And I remember coming home one day and it was raining and my son saying to me, mom, it broke him to see me coming back from doing that. But you know, it might happen to you. There are will be times that you might have to go down to go up. I'll repeat it. There will be times that you're going to have to go down to go up. So I've come here today and I've given you this, oh, fire your belly and whatever, reinvent. But you might go out of here and you might face redundancy, joblessness, you know, and you might have to do something that in your mind is really below you. But it's the attitude you do it in. So whilst I was there bounding back and forth to Yorkshire Building Society, I started to pay attention to what I was seeing. There were loads of refugees and asylum seekers seeking to, pour, and Brits, seeking to poorly circumnavigate the social welfare system. 
And I was a part of a church. I notice the light is the, the timer is on, so somebody time me, please. <laughs> yes, give me ten when I give me the ten minutes countdown. Right. So I I I was a part of a church that had a, a great city center outreach, and uh, they had a block of, of offices in the city center, and I thought, you know what? I I really want to help these people, and I asked them, could you give me an off one of your offices, and they said yes, and I set up a charity to help refugees and asylum seekers. And you know, that particular charity in 2003 landed me my most prestigious speaking engagement to date, and that was at the United Nations. Fully paid for by Bradford Council, not only did they pay for me to go, but they also paid flights for my daughter and someone else to go along with me to look after my daughter whilst I spoke. Right? Now, when we serve others, we might just be serving ourselves. Because another part of the story is when I was in Jamaica, in the height of my career, there was a family of five who were known to my mother who came to the Montego Bay, or as where I was living, and they, they had their package uh, holiday and the hotel they felt was not acceptable. And she rang me and asked me, could you help them? At the time, I happened to have a, a, a pool house. Yeah, I had one of those. <laughs> So you can imagine, right? <laughs> they come down. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, so I had a fully self-contained three-bedroom pool house, and I had them in, I kept them for the weekend before they went on after their second leg in Kingston. And I had my staff come in and serve them. So you know that when I was facing homelessness, and I, I did not sleep on a couch one night, you know why? I slept at theirs, that same family. So sometimes when you're looking after other people, in your process of reinvention, you probably are sowing seeds of kindness for yourself. Okay? So, right, so moving along, right? What I want to say to you is this. The same principles that you use or that I use, are the same principles you have to continue using. Okay? Don't navel gaze. Look outside of yourself. Ask yourself, there is a change coming. What does that mean for me? But also, what does that mean for others? What needs are now arising because of the changing times. Because change is not just, uh, you know, only, Quartec has no monopoly on change. As you can see from the 2020 with the pandemic, we're all thrust into change. And sometimes in order to make the most of that change, we have to, first of all, change ourselves, our, our outlook, our, the way we, we view and, and, and how we treat with things, and then also how we assess the room. You, some, you just need to read the room sometimes. Who are the people around us that need what we, we have? And sometimes it's a thing that we don't really think much of. That's the thing that we need, people need, okay? So because I have taken that journey, first from being over competitive, to being somebody who cared and somebody who is always looking to see what need I can serve and how I can bring others with me, I actually ended up in 20, 2019, it was 2009, um, Haley, working with Quarteg because, yes, of course, you figured it out. It didn't take me long to get my first um, legal job after that. I kind of figured out how to actually do a CV just the avatar of the job you're looking for. <laughs> Not the whole thing. So, uh, so eventually I figured it out and I got my first legal job. And I rose to the top and they took me down to Wales. 
I went, and I was head of property at New Law Solicitors. And where, where I'm going with this is that I had to learn something else. I had to know reinvent. So first I was doing property all along up in, in, in uh, Leeds, come down to uh, Wales. And the law firm that I started to run the, the property department for was only a four-year-old law firm and a six-month-old property department. So I had to learn to go out and network and build business. I had to just jump in feet first, okay? And I did. And in six months, I could not believe what happened. I could not believe what happened. And it, it, everybody wanted to, to, to work with us. Everybody wanted to know me. I mean, nobody cared about the fact that I, didn't, I couldn't pronounce, um, I didn't know what Ab Abercanon was not, uh, was not Abercanon. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody cared about the fact that um, when my staff member <laughs> rang and said, Bernie, I'm gonna be late because my, truck, my train is stuck in mountain ash. And I opened my mouth and said, oh my God, what's happened? What's happened? You know, <laughs> natural disaster. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I was like, okay, what's happened? I'm like, love or love? I'm thinking, like, seriously. <laughs> Nobody, nobody cared about all of that. <laughs> they just really cared about the fact that I cared about them. When I went out to network, I was interested in them. I had something to offer. I knew my stuff, but I wasn't all about my stuff. People just, you know, they just wanted to be in my company. That's what they told me. Because everybody, you know, when the home information packs came out, uh, I remember Capital Card, if it was Red Dragon Radio, uh, invited me to, um, as the expert to just comment on it, and somebody actually said, so why did they choose you? <laughs> because, because they knew me and they liked me. Hey, how about that? Sometimes it's just, <laughs> sometimes it's just about being somebody that is approachable, people like. People buy from you if they like you. They buy you first before they buy what you're selling. It's as easy as that, yes? And you know, you know yourself, you'll pay more money for somebody that you, you really value. You'll go further distance to do business, wouldn't you, with somebody? And I started to learn the art of networking and so on. And long story short, I ended up writing the book on networking, ended up doing a lot of training for Hiratech. I absolutely loved Hiratech. And then what happened? In 2012, when I, I, my networking training was just, oh, just blowing up, like really blowing up. So much so that Capital Card, which was an annual event at the City Hall at the time, they booked me three sessions because they couldn't film the amount of people who wanted to be my session to speak about networking. And that morning, I got the news that my mother passed away in Jamaica. And I was like, okay. What does one do with that? Sometimes you get some news. What do you do with that? Yes. And then, it, then, it, then, then she had the temerity to die on the 29th of February. So, so there's not every year that we can actually say it was, you know, it's like a non day <laughs> for four years. Right? And uh, it was really hard. But you know what I did? And sometimes you've got to, I, I, I did the same thing again. I looked outside of myself and I thought, you know what? I'd be better served serving others today because I am really mad. <laughs> so if I stay home, you know, so I went and I did it. I did the three, set. nobody knew. I, did, I delivered the three seminars and I was supposed to speak at Quiritech on a Thursday and I let you down, didn't I? I had to ring and say, I can't do it. I lost it. My mother was, I mean, she's the, the lady that taught me about knowing myself, picked me up so many times, and I felt like I'd lost my rudder. And I always tell people that you've got to uh, give from a genuine place. 
and I couldn't give from a genuine place. And so I reinvented myself. And that's how we, we bought the restaurant the same year. My husband and I, we bought the, the restaurant and we ran a successful small chain of restaurants for eight years. And yes, it went well. But when you have a purpose, it never leaves you. And sometimes there's, there's a time when you just got to rest a bit and even do something that is not necessarily what you believe you should be doing, but you might need to just do it for a while. And while you're doing it, you do it well. Yes? But then I started to get the niggling. And one of the hints was people started to ask me, those people I talk to in the restaurants, can you coach me? I'm like, oh, well, how do they even know that I coach? I mean, I've been hiding down here in Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know I coach. <laughs> and and, yeah, and one, one of them was um, a lady called Patience Bento. And Patience, she came to me one day and she was, we were just chatting. And whilst I was talking to her, I just had a, I remembered a story. And I thought I'd share it. Because I really got a sense when I was talking to her. And I, I shared it, I said to her, you know, Patience, I'm going to tell you a story about this farm, this man in the farm, and um, he had chickens. And he's looking around at these chickens, and one of them just didn't look right. It's like, you know, that's not doing, oops, yeah, not, not, doing, not, not looking right. And uh, he said, uh, okay, what's going on with this chicken? So one day a friend came and they, they were watching and the friend asked him, what's up with this chicken? Now remember, it's not a true story, right? So work with me. It's not true. <laughs> so, no, <laughs> but it's relevant. So he said, um, why don't you go? He said, I don't know what's wrong with that chicken. So he said, why don't you take that chicken and take it over on that mound, over that mountain over there, and leave it there and see what happens. So he took the chicken over, and it took off soaring because it was an eagle. Yeah? Yeah, it was an eagle. So, um, so it's a, this, is a, this is supposed to be a, 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 you know, a pin drop moment at laughter. <laughs> so, yeah, it was an eagle. And, and, uh, and, so, and, I, and I said to patients, patients, you are that chicken in the farm, like a farmer's garden, you don't belong there. You are an eagle. And I left it with her. A year after that, patients came to me and she said, Bernie, <clears throat> I don't want to be a chicken in the farm anymore. I want to be the eagle I am. Would you coach me? And I coached patients. Six months? But when you know who you are, you don't need a long coaching session. Because once you switch into who you are, things just naturally follow. You get your strategy. You know what you want to do. Some people I just coach for, for, for one session and they just blow right up because they get it. Because you have it in you. Once that switches, man, look out world. Patience, now, she's counselor patience bent you, if you please. Yes, she has a talk show. She is like on BBC, ITV, every other, if there's something to do with, with black history and all of that kind of thing. She was, she was um, big with race called Sukhumri. She was the first Nigerian to be a, um, a counselor and I think the first chair of, a uh, first female chair of her award. Uh, listen, she also won um, the Ethnic Minority Welsh Women's Award, two awards, and the Roger Morgan Award. She's an eagle, <laughs> yeah, right? So guys, don't be that chicken in the farmyard when you're supposed to be that eagle soaring to your destiny. We all have a destiny. Do you know what separates us? You know, we're all thinking, oh, I can One thing separates us. The people who just plod and the people that they look up to. It's vision. Did you hear what Tori said? 
The gentleman asked her, Tori, can you see yourself on Mount Everest? Because he knew that if Tori could see it, she could do it. Where do you see yourself? We've got to get our vision in line with the talent that we have inside of us. They, let's, God, God is not partial. Every one of us has a talent and a gift that we all need. Stop trying to find somebody else's talent within you and ask yourself, what's mine? Because sometimes the thing that we think so little of that we do is the very thing. Yes? No, for me, I, I always say, now I know it's my thing. It's my, I, I, talk, I say, you know, we all have our U-print and we leave it behind wherever we go, whether by default or on purpose. So you need to know what your U-print is and then start to deliberately and intentionally leave it behind. So you make your difference in the world, right? So one of my U-prints is I'm always laughing. And I always used to jokingly say to people, if you see me for 10 minutes and a smile doesn't crack my face, call the ambulance, I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I didn't know that was what was going to open all these many doors for me when I came to Wales. Yeah. I just thought, you know, sometimes you need to just chill out. Why are you always skin skinning a grin so much? No, that's, that's my thing. And I took it for granted until I realized that's who I am. So it doesn't have to be that you're gregarious like me. You can have some quiet confidence. You can just have some Hardcore courage, yes. It could be just that you do things so methodically well because people like me, who is always flying around, need some, <laughs> need some method sometimes, yes. We all have our strengths, okay. So we need to understand the importance in these times of us, of me, of you. And then when you realize, here's the thing, when you understand all of what's in you, it just might inform the way you view other people. The one that you want to discount because they don't look, act, and speak like you. This is what Quiet Tag is all about, isn't it? Anyway, yeah? But I don't mean it in terms of like um, color, race, whatever. It's, I'm talking about skill sets, valuing various skill sets. It's very important because if you are going to get anywhere fast and sustain it, we need each other. One of my great and famous mantras is, we go together or not at all. Say that with me. We go together or not at all. Don't say it like you mean it. <laughs> we go together or not at all. Yes. Come on. Because, you know, as women, we're very good at coming together. But then sometimes we get unstuck when we come together because we're not sure how to relate to each other. And then we, we fall out, and we gossip, and we backbite. Mm, you know I'm talking truth. <laughs> right? So we're not talking about that type, type of together. We're talking about the together that is acutely aware of the power, the value, the sass that is within each and every one of us and figure out a way to do that journey and that life together, right? So I'm gonna wrap up now. There's so much to tell of my journey of reinvention. And my latest journey of reinvention started with a book. My late, one of my recent bestsellers, Your Business, Your Way. 
And it also came out of a desire to do something to help because as I said, I was in the restaurant business. You know, I tell you, people call it universe, whatever I call him, I call him God. As I, you know, you know full disclosure, I, I'm a Christian and I go to church every Sunday. <laughs> and I sing as well. Mm. <laughs> I'm not gonna sing today. <laughs> Right, but um, I was like, okay, so we kind of got out of the restaurant business just in time. Woo, hallelujah! And then we um, then we, okay, what am I going to do? We bought a we bought a, a networking franchise. That was something that came as well, a, an opportunity to buy a networking franchise. I was saying, okay, somebody, God is really telling me I need to go back into where I was coming from. But then we bought the franchise. It launched with ah. 150 businesses um, sponsored by uh, Swansea Council. Everybody was, anybody was there. It was a, a Microsoft, legal consultant, open it, Google, you name it. Ho, ho, ho. That was in March, end of November 2019. And then, psh, that was it. Lockdown. And I did again. And that's, that's it, you know, when you... When you know who you are, you, you understand what you naturally do. You just naturally do it. You start to you be intentional about it, then it becomes a knee-jerk reaction. I looked around and I saw all the businesses. Some of them aren't even taking their calls. They don't know what they're doing. They're in a state. I thought, and everybody online, oh my goodness, online was crazy, wasn't it? It was noisy. And everybody's jostling for attention. Oh, oh. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to write this book. Because I can't reach them, but if I write the book, it will go out. And I wrote the book. I spoke to a publisher, and I, I got it out. And in six months, I got it out. You know why? Because it was in me. So ask yourself, what's in you? That book was in me. It was in my laptop. It was on my, on my, my um, shelf. It was in my manuscripts, all that i written. So ask yourself, what's in you? What do I have? What do I have in my hand? Yes? What do I have in my hand? And I wrote the book. Straight away... Went up to the top, top boom, 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 excitement, you know, really, really good. But then everything started to happen. The calls, the opportunity to speak, everything. It just, it just all, and, you know, since then, I have spoken at the House of Lords more than one time, multiple times, Royal Society, Ex uh, Excel Arena, uh, Ryerson University in Canada, all over the world. Uh, I can't tell you about the brands that I've worked with. I'm, and I'm not trying to show off now, guys. I'm just trying to tell you, for me, my currency is, is, uh, is my brand associations and where I work. The, the, the higher my level, the, 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 the better I can charge. You know, true, we'll talk. <laughs> so for me, that's my currency. But whatever your currency is, if you follow your dream, your currency will show up. So for me, my currency is credible visibility. And I teach people how to do that. There's a strategy, and I teach people how to get credible visibility. Yes? Right now, on the 4th of April, I'm going to be interviewed um, for the next series of Face to Face. I'm going to be the first episode. Look out for it. Half an hour feature on ITV on my life and my work. Now, you know, I, this, there's so much I, that's happening that I can't say. But what I'm trying to say to you guys is if you are prepared to embrace change, yes, reinvent from an authentic place, know yourself and embrace your uprint, you will be on the path to becoming the eagle that you are. So I leave you with one of my most favorite quotes, which is Brutus in Julius Caesar. There are tides in the affairs of men which taken at the flood lead unto fortune. On such a full sea, we are now afloat and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. Now is the time. The wave of change is coming. Hop on. Ride the course of that wave because we go together or not at all. Thank you. In terms of really having these challenges and you know you talked about reinvention earlier yes. but it's just about having you talked as well about having that um self-talk 
that, yes. that sort of helped you through in finding what yes. was true to you? Oh, gosh, yes, because, uh, you know, when Tori was talking, you know, <laughs> I remembered a time in my life, as you said, you mentioned some things that you don't mention, some of you kind of jump over certain points. And I used to tell the story about moving to Wales and I jumped and going to new law solicitors and I jumped over the point in between. There were two months mm -hmm. in between. Because when I moved down to Wales, I came down to Wales because I drove through Wales to go to Chepstow one day in 2005. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is the most beautiful place ever. This is a true story. I thought, this place is amazing. And I wanted to move down. I, in 2006, I said to myself, why, why, why do you keep just thinking about this place? Just do something about it. So I, I signed up on a legal recruitment website. It felt as if when I press send, the phone rang. I came down to Wales and I stayed at the Wenvo, I'll never forget, Wenvo Travel Lodge, did three job interviews, got the three job offers, took the best one, and um, so when you're supposed to do something, things just work. Because a friend of mine was going through a divorce, she rented my house furnished in Bradford, and I rented a, a, an apartment, a furnished apartment in Penarth Marina. But what I didn't tell you is that I came down with my daughter, and my husband at the time, and I started the job at this law firm, and within a month, I realized I had some very chronic female illness, which would not go away without an operation, and I couldn't get, with, get it within a year, so I lost the job, and I lost the job, I was at home in my bed, uh, really, 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 really ill. My husband walked out, and he took all our money. This is a true story. And my daughter at the time was on holiday in Jamaica. That was when I had to do some self-talk. Mm. And I said to myself, number one, you can't get another job because you know the likelihood is that you will not be well. You can't lie here in the bed. Right? You're in a new city. I bought a sat-nav. That's the first thing I did. <laughs> and then... I decided I'm going to sign up as a locum. I got a locum, I went to the doctor and I said, listen, you need to pump me up with these steroids because you need to keep this situation at bay because I need to work. I took a locum position in Swindon where I got up in the morning, I drove my car to Penarth train station, I took the train to um, Cardiff, Bristol Parkway, got off in Swindon, took a taxi and got to work at 8.30 in the morning. And I did so well at that job and made a lot of money at that job that they even offered me money I could not refuse if it weren't for my daughter to move to Swindon. But I just moved her to Cardiff and I said no. And then at that time, Michael Page it was, spoke to Helen Molyneux at New Law Solicitors about this lady that they had on their books. And I told Helen Molyneux my story and the rest is history. That's why I became head of property and new law solicitors. Mm. Aren't stories empower, powerful as well, aren't yeah. they? You know, when you tell people your story, sharing the story, yeah. being your authentic yeah. self, I think. That's some of the things you talked about earlier. Yes. Um, Jodie, moving... Um, and I know I know. I talked about my younger self earlier when I spoke. And uh, so I, I won't use the one that you probably expect me to say, which is know yourself, because my mother told me that enough. But... Um, <laughs> To my younger self, it would be, don't worry so much. Just don't worry so much. Mm. The reason I was an obnoxious teenager who uh, was trying their best to make a mark academically and to be the teacher's pet is because I worried. I worried about how I was viewed. I worried about being accepted. There was fear there, and because of fear, I allowed myself to be consumed with a mission to prove to the world that I belonged. And so I would have said to my younger self, don't worry so much about that. Uh, instead, embrace yourself, love yourself, because when you have love, then, then you're empowered. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. that's you know, amazing advice to give to anybody. Absolutely, and I would love to have heard that when I was younger as well. Tori, today. Right, interesting uh, question. So I'll answer the question, but I've got to put a little bit of a, you know, side answer to it as well. 
So yes, it's important to show allyship to women of color. And I think the most important thing to do is to not make assumptions because we are all women of color, but then we are all women. So, you know, each woman of color has a different set of experiences, uh, different backgrounds. Some have come from privilege, some don't. Some have different uh, weird and wonderful experiences. Uh, some are from different economic backgrounds, and some are from different um, religious and political and sexual orientations. So it, it, in and of itself, I think it would be having a, a, a subjective approach, not a general approach, and, and get to know what will actually help these women. But as I said in my workshop on, on allyship, we need to realize that they're all women and men need to be considered. I know I'm asked a question about because I'm a woman of color, but I've learned in the very many workshops I've done and the, 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 the exercises that I've had my um, cohort uh, participate in that white women are, are othered just like the rest of us. Whether you, you, know, you could be ginger, you're, you're, um, you're brunette and not blonde, you uh, are from the valleys, you know, you don't, your parents don't have money, uh, all sorts of different reasons that would make uh, white women and men feel othered. So to my mind, I think we need to actually have a cross the board subjective approach to this question of allyship and understand that we all need to be understood. We all need to be asked and encouraged to, to, to be safe in the space that we are in. And that can only happen by making room for everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, Bernie. I mean, that's re it's really powerful. Treating people as individuals mm -hmm. with different needs, supporting people in the way that they want to be supported, mm -hmm. understanding, kindness, tolerance, not mm -hmm. making assumptions. Mm -hmm. And above all, as you said, Tori, be kind. Mm -hmm. Because you never know what other people are facing. Yeah. Um, well, and that's the way we all make our way in the world. Oh, but it? can I just share something that happened in my session? Oh, my God, it was amazing. Oh, we were talking and we did a, a, an exercise, which I always do on, on, on privilege. And we asked, we had about eight questions and I asked people to answer. And, you know, have, these are, you know, things that I've never had to go through. I've never had to, I've never had to, I've never had to, I've never had to, I've never had to. Never had to. And I had people then stand up, who, who has eight, six, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And then I did the exercise because it showed in the five that stood up who had the least, um, you know, there were three white women and two, um, one Asian, one black woman, yes? So the white women, they were suffering as well. And then I went on and then I had a little hand that went up and said, Bernie, what about the person who had zero? Oh, that broke us. Zero. There is absolutely no time that this person has felt like they belonged. And you, you can imagine the room, what happened in the room. That just spoke volumes. In fact, when the first question, which was a wrong question, came up and said, what do you take away from here? I was ready to answer because I'm going to take away from here that I have to always ask who has absolutely no ability to take even one element of privilege. And that's something that we just need to all bear in mind, guys. No assumptions. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Well, I've got to tell you, Judy, I think it's a young, it's a yuppie thing, you know, these, <laughs> because my daughter is the same. And I'm sure when she has her child, she's going to do the whole, I'm like, seriously? <laughs> it's this new age thing. <laughs> right. well, for me, well, I can safely tell you, I don't know how to manage my work life. <laughs> Keeping it real. <laughs> I was keeping it real. I think I should do everything for everyone all the time. <laughs> I speak to my kids every day. I have four kids who live all over the world. Different part. I speak to them every day. I, I, we, this sums it up. We had, a, uh, had an event in London on, uh, early on the week, and one of the ladies, uh, one of the questions she asked me was, Bernie, every time I ring you, you answer your phone. How do you manage that? <laughs> 
No, but it's the truth. So I don't manage it very well. And then when you work with a husband, he works with me with the networking business. So, and we love to work. So we'll be there and we'll just go, we'll go to a restaurant and we'll say, no talk about work. And then that would be me, you know. No talk about work. All right. Yes, dear, he says. So I sit down and I start. So, you know, he said, no talk about work. <laughs> and, you know, this, and I'm up, I work all the time. I love it. We are, and I, no, I don't have a work-life balance. Yeah, and uh, so every now and again, I have a day when I wake up and, I, and I'm like in tears, and he'll say to me, my husband will say to me, okay, so you're tired now? <laughs> yeah, I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> get off your phone, get some sleep. So true confession, I need to work on my work-life balance. I love my work too much. I love my life too much, and I need to sort it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's <laughs> properly keeping it real. But we're all a bit like that sometimes, aren't we? we? Sometimes we do it well. Sometimes we're really, really rubbish at it. Yeah. And, and then that's when we sort of fall down and think, I need, I need days, yeah. I need a <laughs> duvet day or whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Tori, you, 